like Jacksonville, Florida, where the glimpse are working. Well, my name is Derek. We have a privilege now of spending some time in God's Word together. I'm thankful that you're here, even if you're joining us online. We're going to be in John chapter 3, so if you have your Bibles, find your way to John chapter 3. Uh, we've been walking through a series, several series, that are taking us through the book of the Gospel of John, and over the last few weeks, we've been going through John chapters 2 and 3, focused on this statement, whoever believes. John really emphasizes, and Jesus in his teaching teaching emphasize in these chapters that statement, whoever believes. We've seen that those who believe in Jesus find full and abundant life, that Jesus kills dead religion, that you must be born again, that God reveals the mysteries of heaven. And then last week in John 3, 16, we saw that God wants to give you new life. This week, we learn about salvation. So I wanted to ask you, have you been saved? Now, I don't mean that in the spiritual sense. I mean that in the literal sense. Have you ever been saved from something? Maybe it's choking or uh, maybe it's a medical diagnosis that was caught just in time. That's certainly part of my story. Have you ever been saved from danger? Maybe it's the danger of drowning or maybe you, when you were a kid, you were saved from a bully. When I was 16 years old, I was driving down Highway 179, headed from my house into the booming metropolis of Boaz, Alabama, and I was headed to hang out with some friends. And so I was on my way and I can't remember what I, what, what I was doing at the time. I think I I was trying to turn the station on the radio. Kids, just leave the radio alone when you're driving. But uh, I wasn't paying as much of attention as I should. And I was probably going 55 miles an hour or so down this little two-lane highway. I ran off the road just a little bit and uh, then pulled back on the road, lost control. And as I lost control, I went back off the road and there was a ditch that ran parallel to the side of the road. And I got into that ditch and headed about 55 miles an hour down this ditch. I could see the culvert coming at the end of this ditch. And I'm telling you, it was the most interesting feeling. I'd actually been praying as a follower of Christ. I'd really been praying, God, like when it comes time for me to die, will I really believe? Will I really have faith? And I believe God used this instant to answer this, this prayer because I'd really been wondering that. Oh, it's easy to believe God when you're a teenager and you got your whole life out ahead of you. But really, when it comes time to die. And in that moment, I thought, this is it. I could see my car, my truck was headed uh, towards that culvert. I was caught in the ditch. There was nothing I could do. I could not move my steering wheel because the way the ditch was shaped. And, and so I'm headed straight for this, which is basically a concrete wall. And so as I'm going along that ditch, I, I just had this thought, well, this is it. And do you know, it was, the, it was the greatest sense of peace that I could imagine. It was, hey, this is it and it's going to be okay. That was really how I felt in that moment. But obviously, God did not see fit to bring me home in that moment. Uh, as I got just a few feet from the culvert, there was a rock that was in just the right place. And when my front driver's side tire hit that rock, it raised my truck up just enough that instead of hitting the culvert head on, I hit it at an angle, and I ramped it and landed in a man's cow pasture. <laughs> Took out the fence post, had to fix his fence post. But anyway, so I was okay. In that last moment, I was saved. I was saved by what I believe is the providential hand of God. I was saved by a rock being in the right place at the right time. But I felt like there was imminent danger coming. And if something did not intervene, then all hope was lost. My life was gone. Have you ever been saved from something? Well, I want to tell you today... In John chapter 17, verse 20, uh, verses 17 through 21, chapter 3, verses 17 through 21, we're going to see this. God offers the world salvation through Jesus. But the question is, salvation from what? For me, it was salvation from a wreck that would have likely ended my life. But when we talk about being saved in a spiritual sense, so often we lose the context of salvation from what? Well, I want us to see in this passage today that God actually saves us from several things. John chapter 3, verses 17 through 21, the Bible says this, For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through Him. Whoever believes in Him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world. 
And people loved the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his works should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. Would you pray with me? Father, as we dive into your word, would you write its truths on our heart? And God, today, would you save someone? We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. God offers the world salvation through Jesus. Coming right on the heels of John 3.16. Coming right on the heels of this great message that God loved the world enough to send His only Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish. We talked about this last week. So there's perishing and there's eternal life. Coming right on the heels of that great statement, the Bible tells us that, see, God did not send His world into the world to condemn the world. That's good news. Uh, but that the world might be saved through him. Why? Because Scripture tells us we stand condemned already. God is offering salvation to the world through Jesus. What is he offering salvation from? When we come to Christ, what exactly is it we are saved from? If you don't know the Lord today, what is the offer that is extended to you? And if you do know the Lord, if you have placed your faith in Jesus, I want you to see today what you have been saved from. First, we want to see in this passage that through Jesus we are saved from judgment. Saved from judgment. So, the word condemnation, you saw it several times. Condemned uh, is mentioned several times in this passage. And then there's the word, word judgment. You need to know that they are basically the same word. So it's the same root word. One is a noun, one is a verb. Uh, So God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world. There it is. But in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned. There it is again. Uh, But whoever does not believe is condemned already. There it is again. And then one more time in verse 19, this is the judgment or this is the condemnation. So that word condemned or judgment is in this passage several times, God's drawing our attention to something. When we are saved, we are saved from judgment. Whoever believes is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already. See, what God is telling us in His Word is that condemnation is the set course of mankind. It's like me in that ditch. I mean, once I'm in that ditch, the set course is my death. It's coming to an abrupt end, and it's not going to go well for me unless something changes. See, we've got to understand that that is the course of our life. From our earliest days, we are set on a path Because of our own sin, we're set on a path of condemnation and judgment. It's the direction that we're heading. It doesn't go like this, well, you know, I guess if my life gets off track too bad, then I might need Jesus. Your life, my life, has been off track since day one. Day one, it actually started off track. It started in sin, off track, headed toward judgment, and the end of it is judgment. That's why Jesus says, that's why God's Word says that whoever does not believe is condemned already. That's already the course of your life. Those of you who have raised children, we have our graduates that we're celebrating here today, and at one time or not, uh, another, believe it or not, you were a little bitty baby, and your moms and dads held you, and they thought, wow, here's this beautiful little baby. But anybody who's raised kids, or even been around kids, the one thing that we learn about kids is that every time they develop a new capacity to do something, crawling, walking, running, talking, the first thing that they do is use it to break all the new rules that they can now break. (laughs) Before, they wanted to do those things. They just couldn't. They were limited. Oh, but now they can. (laughs) And once they can, they do. Adults are no different. Every time a new technology comes out, what do we start seeing? Stories, headlines about how people are using this technology for evil. Wouldn't you just once love for something new to come out and then see, wow, the world has used this new technology for good and good only. I don't know, long before we come up with the good benefits of how to use any particular technology, a lot of evil people in the world have already found ways to use it for evil. Why? Because that's the course of humanity. That is the course that we are set on. It's the course of sin that leads to condemnation and judgment. So when we're saved, when God intervenes, when God intersects our lives with the good news of the gospel, we are saved from judgment. And understand that judgment is not something that only comes hereafter. See, that's what John's actually telling us. Here's what the gospel of John 
is telling us here that whoever believes is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already. And this is the condemnation. This is it. Here it is. Understand the light's come into the world and you have rejected the light. Leads me to the second part of the message that through Jesus we are saved from darkness. So we're saved from judgment. Judgment is coming. When God intervenes through Jesus, we are saved from the coming judgment. We are also saved from darkness. The Gospel of John tells us that the light has come into the world and people love the darkness rather than the light because their works are evil. So there's darkness. That's our natural state. That's where we are. We are born in darkness and without Jesus we stay in darkness. We're headed towards judgment and we are in darkness. And darkness has a way of giving sin its power. I don't know if you know this or not, whether you're a Christian or you're not yet a follower of Christ, I want you to know something. Sin finds its power in darkness. Uh, sin loves to stay hidden. And sin loves to stay hidden because that's when it, where its power comes from. I used to live in South Florida. Anybody know about palmetto bugs? Okay, we got some palmetto bugs. They, I hear they're over in Louisiana too. You can find them in the panhandle. They're everywhere. They are of the devil. We all know that. Those palmetto bugs, those three-inch demon-possessed bugs, we know what they are. But here's the thing I learned about palmetto bugs when I lived in South Florida. They don't actually like to live inside. They don't do well inside. They're really outside bugs. But they find their way into your home, and there's really nothing you can do. Eventually, you're going to get some palmetto bugs in your house. And then they have wings, y'all. They fly. I mean, what kind of demonic thing is this? But here's what I learned about them living in South Florida, is they don't, because they're not designed to live inside, they don't function well inside. So you see this big, long, ugly bug in your house, and, and you panic, and you try to get it, and it scurries behind some furniture. And boy, it has a lot of power. It's hidden. You can't get to it. And so that, that bug is safe, and there's nothing you can do about it. But because they don't know how to function inside, here's what I learned. If you'll wait just a minute, it'll run out from behind that furniture. It has no idea that if it'll just stay behind the furniture, then you can't get to it. But it'll run out from behind that furniture. And you know what I learned about a palmetto bug? In the wide, open, hardwood floor of our living room, they're pretty easy to deal with. <laughs> My shoe can take care of it. Do you know sin is the same way? Well, sin is very, very powerful when it is hidden. See, sin, your sin, my sin, a lot smarter than a palmetto bug. Your sin will fight to stay hidden. Your sin will tell you this. Hey, you deal with this, and whatever you do, don't let anybody know. You can handle this. Christian, it even comes to us in this sense. Hey, your sin's pretty bad, but just kind of talk to God about it. Don't get too specific, and you really don't have to acknowledge your sin, and all will be well. God will forgive you. That's why our repentance goes something like this. God, help me. I hadn't been perfect today. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, folks, that's not repentance. It's not confession either. The word confession means to agree with God. The word confession means to say about your sin what God would say about your sin. How do we know what God would say about our sin? Well, hasn't he given us a glossary of terms? <laughs> so instead of coming to God and saying, God, I'm not perfect. Help me be better. Amen. Oh, no, God's given us the language we ought to use. God, I looked with my eyes in lust at someone who is not my spouse. Would you forgive me of the sin of adultery? See how much different that is? God, I, I took something that wasn't my own. I stole. Would you forgive me for being a thief? God, I lied to get out of a situation. Lord, would you forgive me for lying? Lord, I, I said some things about somebody in order to tear their character down. God, would you forgive me of slander? Oh, Pastor, now it was true. What I said was true. You know, slander can be true. Most slander is. 
Slander is anything that comes out of your mouth, whether true or false, that is in, in, its intention is simply to tear someone else down. That is slander. Gossip. A lot of gossip is true. Lord, I gossiped about this person. The scripture has a lot to say about gossip. So see how different that is? And what do you say? Well, I don't, I don't like doing that. That doesn't feel comfortable to say to God, God, I did this thing. But that is the language that God has given us. If you confess your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive you and to cleanse you of all unrighteousness. Some come to me between services and say, well, sometimes I don't remember all my sins. He'll remind you. <laughs> Lord, uh, can you remind me of any unconfessed sin in my life? Lord, will you let me know if there's any wicked way in me? And just listen, and he will bring them to mind. Lord, confess. Help me confess my sins. Now, now here's the thing. God loves you, and God's going to forgive you. But, but doesn't God also require something else of us? God requires that we go to the person that we need to be made right with. Hmm. Lord, I, I slandered this person. Will you please forgive me? Yes, you're forgiven. Step two is to go to that person. Look them in the eye and say, listen, I, I said some things about you last week, last month, last year, or a decade ago. And my intent was to tear you down. And I need you to forgive me. You say, Pastor, I, I can't do that. You don't know what that other person has done to me. I'm, I'm, I'm going to speak to Christians for just a moment. Lost people, you're off the hook for just a minute. My dear brother and sister in Christ, it has nothing to do with what that person did to you or how good or bad that person is. And it has everything to do with this. The Lord Jesus Christ, while you were still a sinner, gave his life for you. And you extend forgiveness to the other person based on the merits of the grace that God has extended to you, not based on the merits of the person that you are extending forgiveness to or that you're asking forgiveness of. It is all based simply on the fact that God chose to extend grace to you when you did not deserve it. And I'll tell you this, you're off the hook. I'll let you off the hook. The minute that you can convince me that you deserve God's grace, then you no longer have to go to that brother or sister who does not deserve for you to come to them and offer forgiveness. Their sin might very well have been greater than yours, but their sin is theirs to deal with, and your sin is yours to deal with. And God Almighty calls you to be right with your brother and sister in Christ as much as it depends on you. Get it out in the light. See, it's easy to think in general about being saved from darkness. But when we really start to think about this, we see how difficult it is. Those of you who don't know the Lord, I know you walk into a place like this and you think, man, I'm the only person in the room that's got any issues and got any problems, and so i got to kind of pretend and that happens a lot, by the way. I know this because I've been in ministry 25 years and I don't know how this goes. Like you walk into this room and you think, I can't let people in this room know who I really am. I can't really confess my sin. I can't be open about my sin because these people have their lives all together. Do you know, Christians, I'm going to let you know something. If you've gone to church your entire life, I'm going to let you know something that I've heard from lost people who visited church for the first time. This has come from multiple people who visited for church for the first time. They've said this, I was terrified to bring my children to church because I know Christians' children, uh, children of Christians, are all obedient and sit quietly during church. <laughs> Yeah, I laughed, I laughed too. I was like, wow, you, you, <laughs> it's really not like that. I mean, you can come. It's going to be okay. If your kids are loud, we probably won't hear them because of my kids, right? That's just, it's going to be okay. 
But when people walk into a church, sometimes they think everybody in this room, they have it all together. They've never had any issues. They've never had any problems. And so I can't come to uh, them with my issues. And I certainly can't confess to God because I've got to kind of keep this ruse up that I've got it all together. And once I get my life figured out and once I'm kind of halfway there, then I can go to God and I can say, God, I, I just need a little bit of extra help to get to where I need to be. But the truth is you are trapped in darkness. You are headed towards judgment, and God offers you salvation from both. You cannot get yourself out of the darkness, and you cannot save yourself from judgment, but praise be to God, He has offered it to you freely. Salvation. It's yours. It's yours if you will have it. Colossians chapter 1 verse 13, one of my favorite verses, He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of His beloved Son. There are two and only two kingdoms in this world. There is the domain of darkness and there is the kingdom of Jesus. And God has offered you free access to the kingdom of Jesus. He wants to save you and take you out of the domain of darkness and transfer you into the kingdom of His beloved Son. That is His desire for you. And if you're here today and you don't know the Lord, I want you to know the way has been made. The door is open. The path is cleared. All you have to do, whoever believes, whoever believes is not condemned. You are on a path to judgment. You are headed to certain judgment. At the end, it is not good for you. And if you will believe, you will be spared. Judgment, you'll be delivered from darkness. And then third, through Jesus, we are saved from sin. This is really what it comes down to. This is the foundational piece. John, Gospel of John chapter 3 says, For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his works should be exposed. The pain of having your sin exposed keeps you from salvation. The pain of having your sin known even to God can keep you from salvation. The truth is God already knows your sin. And the darkness that you're in, and darkness comes in all forms. You know, you can feel the world growing darker, can't you? I mean, you just feel it. Like that there's, there's darkness. Speaking to someone last week, one of our church members who had traveled to one of the cities that we've been emphasizing in our Annie Armstrong time and, and talking about church planting there. And he said, I was there. And when I was there, I could feel the darkness. I understood exactly what he meant. I've been in those same places. I felt that way when I, when I lived in the city of Miami. Sometimes I'd go out for a run and listen, I'm, I'm Baptist, I'm not Pentecostal, but listen, y'all, demons are, weir- are, are real. They're weird too, but they're weir- real. And they are, there are spiritual forces, and this is real. There is a supernatural world that is more real than the world you can see with your own eyes. And sometimes I'd just be in a particular part of town, and I just knew it. I could just sense the darkness and the heaviness and the spiritual oppression there. And there is that kind of darkness. But then there's also that internal darkness. Depression. Anxiety, insecurity, fear. It takes over. And there it is. And the truth is you're, you're headed for judgment. That's that eternal death that he talks about in 316. That you should not perish, perishing for all of eternity. And then there's the darkness, that anxiety and that fear and that just domain of darkness, an entire kingdom of darkness where there's no such thing as Light And yes, the light has pierced the darkness, but men have ran from it. Men and humans, they have gotten away from it because they don't like the light, because they're afraid that their sin will be exposed, and that's the truth of the matter. You are in a prison. If you don't know Jesus, you're in a prison. You are destined for judgment. You are destined for eternal perishing, and it's a prison cell of darkness, and it's filled with anxiety and fear and depression and everything that is dark and all kind you can feel it you know the darkness around you you know the darkness inside of you but here's the thing the door to the prison cell is actually open and what keeps you in that prison cell is you it's your sin 
That's what Scripture says. The light has come into the world. But men love the darkness more than the light because their deeds are evil. Everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light. What does that mean? It means they could. They could come to the light lest his works should be exposed. You'll remember if you've been with us for the last few weeks that this comes in the context of Jesus' discussion with Nicodemus. All the way back in the very first verses of John chapter 3, there was a man named Nicodemus, a member of the Pharisees, who came to Jesus at night. Remember that? At night. So Nicodemus has stepped out of the darkness of the night, if you will, into the light of this place where he and Jesus are meeting. But there's an even stronger light there, and it's the light of Jesus himself. And there Nicodemus sits in his spiritual darkness. And the light is right there. The light has come into the world and Nicodemus has found himself in the room with it. And what will Nicodemus do? In this moment, John 3, Nicodemus is not quite ready to step into the light. There'll come a time later when Nicodemus will step into the light. But here, it's there and he just can't quite bring himself it's too painful. And Nicodemus misses his opportunity for salvation. Don't make that mistake. Don't make the mistake of coming to a place like this week after week or maybe for the first time. Watching online, hearing the gospel, knowing that God offers salvation through Jesus, salvation from judgment, darkness, and ultimately from sin. Do not make the mistake of coming this close to the light and saying, it's too painful. Your sin will fight you every step of the way because sin loves the darkness. But let me tell you something. Sin is a cancer and it will kill you. But if you will simply expose it to the light of Jesus Christ, there is a life that you are not aware of. And oh, it's, it's hard. It's tough. But once you let the light of the gospel shine into the darkness, you'll say, why, did, why didn't I do this 10, 20, 30 years ago? There is a life that is available for you, for me, there is salvation that is available. And dear follower of Christ, don't buy into the lie of the enemy. And oh yeah, you needed to confess your sin to get saved, but now that you're saved, you don't really have to do the hard work of confession and making it right with your brother or sister in Christ. And in a church our size, it's just inevitable that we have people who come into a room like this and they sit on this side because of somebody they know who sits on that side. Or you come to the second service because you know somebody else who goes to the first service. Or all those people who come to the first service, some of them say, I'm going to the first service because I know who comes to the second service. Maybe you've left your life group because you know who's in that life group. And you're not right with your brother and sister in Christ. In our life group, the story today was about Joseph. You remember Joseph? You remember what his brothers did to him? threw him in a pit. They were going to kill him. They stole his jacket that his dad had made for him. They were going to kill him. And they said, nah, instead of killing him, we won't get any money for that. Let's sell him. They sold him as a slave, sent him to Egypt. He became a slave and worked his way up through the ranks. Was a high-level servant in the house of Potiphar. Then he was falsely accused and thrown into prison. And then God in his providence elevated him to the second highest place in all of Egypt. I'm sure there's some folks in our church who've done some mean things to you. I bet they haven't done that. If they have, we really need to talk. <laughs> and what was Joseph's response? There he was with the ability to squish them like a bug. He said, nope. I will forgive them. I'll extend grace to them. I'll serve them. It's the same thing God calls us to. You say, well, that, that person doesn't deserve it. 
No, but the grace of God has been extended to you in an undeserved manner. So you are to extend grace to others in that same manner. We are saved from judgment. We are saved from darkness. We are saved from sin. I can't help but think back to that moment. It's a 16-year-old young man driving down the road, getting stuck in that ditch. Nowhere to go. And, and the trajectory of my car was carrying me forward. There's no way to stop. And time is running out. And then by the grace of God, He intervenes and He pulls me out of that and saves my life. Maybe today is that day for you. Maybe today God has chosen to intervene in your life and offer you this salvation from judgment, from darkness, from sin. Will you have it? Father, thank you for your word. Thank you, God, for your salvation. Thank you for Jesus through whom you have saved us. Lord, I pray that you would move in the hearts and lives of those in this room and those watching online and draw them to salvation, draw them to repentance. I pray this in Jesus' name.